Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Wisteria House Part 2 have you formed any opinion about this affair, Watson? asked Holmes, later the same afternoon. As the servants have disappeared, I think that perhaps they were concerned in the crime, I said. It is possible, he said. But why should they attack him on the one night when he had a guest? But why did they run away, I objected. That, Watson, is the problem. Mr. Scott Eccles's strange experience is also a mystery. Why should a pleasant young man like Garcia want the friendship of a rather stupid middle-aged person like Scott Eccles? What is Scott Eccles's most noticeable quality? He is clearly an honest man, an old-fashioned Englishman whom other Englishmen believe and trust. You saw how those two policemen accepted his strange story. Garcia wanted him as a witness, Watson. But what was he supposed to witness? He could have sworn that his host was at home at one o'clock this morning. When Garcia told him it was one, it was probably no later than midnight. What is your explanation of the message? Our own colors, green and white. That sounds like a horse race, Holmes replied. And green open white shut must be a signal. The rest of the note seems to be an appointment. There may be a jealous husband somewhere in this case. Then there is the signature. The man was a Spaniard. Perhaps the letter D stands for Dolores, since that is a common female name in Spain. Good, Watson, very good, but quite impossible. A Spaniard would write to another Spaniard in Spanish. The writer of this note is certainly English. The affair is still very mysterious. I have sent a telegram which may bring us some helpful information. When the answer to Holmes's telegram came, he passed it across to me. It was only a list of names and addresses. Lord Harringby, I read. The Dingle. Sir George Folliot. Oxshot Towers. Mr. Hines. Hurdy Place. Mr. James Baker Williams. Horton Old Hall, Mr. Henderson, High Gable, Mr. Joshua Stone, Nether Walsling. I don't quite understand, Holmes. My dear friend, have you forgotten the message that D sent to Garcia? Main stairs, first passage, seventh on the right. The house we are looking for has more than one staircase, and one of the passages contains at least seven doors. It must be a very large house, Watson and it is probably within a mile or two of Oxshot. My telegram was to Allen Brothers, the property company. I asked them to send me a fist of all the large houses in the Oxshot area, and here it is. We traveled down to Eastshire by train later in the afternoon and took rooms in the village at the Bull Hotel. We went along to Wisteria House with Mr. Baines that evening. The house was in darkness, except for a low light in one window on the ground floor. There's a policeman inside, Baines explained. I'll knock at the window. 
He crossed the grass and knocked on the glass. I heard a cry and saw a policeman jump up nervously from his chair. A moment later, he opened the front door to us. He was shaking violently. What's the matter, Walters? asked Baines. I am glad you have come, sir. It has been a long wait. It's a lonely, silent house, and that strange thing in the kitchen, too. When you knocked at the window, I thought the devil had come again. What do you mean? Baines asked sharply. The devil, sir. It was at the window. What was at the window, and when? It was about two hours ago. It was just beginning to get dark. I was reading. I don't know what made me look up, but there was a horrible face at the window. I shall see it in my dreams, sir. I know I shall. A policeman should never talk in that way, Walters. I know, sir, but it really frightened me. It wasn't black, sir, and it wasn't white. It was a kind of light brown, the color of clay. And it was very large, sir, twice the size of your face. And it had big eyes and great white teeth like a wild animal's. I think you must have been dreaming, Walters, said Baines. We can easily find out said Holmes. He lit his small pocket lamp and looked closely at the grass outside the window. Yes, a size 12 shoe, I think. He must have been a big man. Where did he go? I asked. He seems to have walked through these bushes. Well, said Baines, we have other things to think of now, Mr. Holmes. Let me show you the kitchen. This was a high, dark room at the back of the house. We saw a pile of straw and a few bedclothes. It appeared that the cook slept there. The table was covered with dirty plates and half-eaten food, the remains of the meal which Mr. Scott Eccles had shared the previous evening. Look at this, said Baines. What do you think it is? He held up his lamp to let us see a strange object on top of a cupboard. It was a black, leathery, dried up thing shaped like a baby or a small monkey. A double band of seashells was tied round it. Interesting, said Holmes. Very interesting. Is there anything else? In silence, Baines led the way to the other side of the kitchen and held up his lamp again. There, on a small table, we saw the legs, wings, head and body of a large white bird. The feathers were still on them, but the bird had been torn to pieces. How strange, said Holmes. This really is a very unusual case. Mr. Baines had kept the most horrible thing of all until the last. He bent down and pulled a bucket out from under the small table. It was full of blood. We also found some burnt bones, he said. A young goat seems to have been killed here. A young goat and a white bird. Very strange, said Holmes, very strange and very interesting. Well, there is nothing more for me to do here. Thank you, Mr. Baines. Good night and good luck. Over the next few days, Holmes told me nothing of the results of his inquiries. One day, he visited a library in London, but he spent most of his time in country walks around Esher and Oxshott. He pretended to be a collector of rare plants but he spent many hours in conversation with the village people. His plant box was usually almost empty in the evenings when he came back to the hotel where we were staying. About five days after the crime, I opened my morning paper and saw in large letters the Oxshot mystery, a solution murderer caught. When I read this out to Holmes, he jumped out of his chair as if he had been stung. Good heavens, he cried, so Baines has got him? It appears that he has, I replied, and read the report out loud to him. Great excitement was caused in Esher and the neighboring area last night, when a man was charged in connection with the Oxshot murder. Our readers will remember that Mr. Garcia, of Wisteria House, was found dead near Oxshot last week. His body showed signs of extreme violence. On the same night, his servant and his cook disappeared. Their flight seemed to show that they had something to do with the murder. 
the police thought that the dead man might have had gold or jewels in the house, and that robbery was the real reason for the crime. Mr. Baines of the Surrey Police made great efforts to track the two servants down. He believed that they had not gone far, and that it would be easy to find their hiding place. The cook in particular was a man of very noticeable appearance, a large, dark-skinned foreigner. This man was seen by one of Baines' men, Walters, at Wisteria House on the day after the crime. After this, Mr. Baines decided to move his men from the house to the grounds, where they hid behind the trees every evening. The cook walked into this trap last night. In the struggle downing, another policeman was badly bitten, but the man was overpowered and taken to the police station. We are told that the prisoner has been charged with the murder of Mr. Garcia. We must see Baines immediately, cried Holmes, picking up his hat. The house where Baines was staying was only a short distance away. We hurried down the village street and found that he was just leaving. You've seen the paper, Mr. Holmes, he asked, holding one out to us. Yes, Baines, I've seen it. Please don't be angry with me if I give you a word of friendly warning. Of warning, Mr. Holmes? I have looked into the case very carefully, and I think you may be making a mistake. I don't want you to do anything unless you are sure. You're very kind, Mr. Holmes. I am only speaking for your own good. It seemed to me that Mr. Baines closed one of his eyes for a moment and gave a slight smile. You have your methods, Mr. Holmes, and I have mine. Oh, very good, said Holmes, but don't blame me if things go wrong. No, sir, I believe you mean well, but I am dealing with this case in my own way. Let us say no more about it, but let me tell you about the cook. He's a wild man as strong as a cart horse, and as violent as the devil. He nearly bit Downing's thumb off before they could master him. He hardly speaks a word of English, and only makes noises in his throat like an animal. And you think that he murdered his master? I didn't say so, Mr. Holmes. I didn't say so. We all have our own methods. You can try yours, and I will try mine. I don't understand Baines at all, said Holmes, as we walked away together. He seems to be on completely the wrong track. Well, as he says, each of us must try his own way. We shall see the results. When we were back in our sitting room at the Bull Hotel, Holmes asked me to sit down. I have many things to tell you about this case, Watson, he said, and I may need your help tonight. First of all, he went on. I have been thinking about the note that Garcia received on the evening of the murder. We can dismiss the idea that his servants had anything to do with his death. It was Garcia who was planning a crime that night. It was he who invited Scott Eccles, the perfect witness, and it was he who lied to him about the time. I believe Garcia died in the course of a criminal adventure. Who, then, Holmes continued, is most likely to have taken his life, surely the person against whom Garcia's criminal plan was directed. We can now see a reason for the disappearance of the people in Garcia's house. They were all involved in his plan. If the plan had succeeded, Garcia would have returned home, and Scott Eccles would have been useful to him as a witness. All would have been well, but the attempt was a dangerous one, and if Garcia did not return by a certain time, the servants would know he was probably dead. It had been arranged, therefore, that in such a case they would escape to their hiding place. From that hiding place they could make another attempt to carry out the plan. That would fully explain the facts, wouldn't it? The mystery seemed much clearer to me now. I wondered, as I always did with Holmes, why I had not thought of the explanation myself. But why should one of the servants return to Wisteria House? I objected. I think that perhaps in the confusion of flight, something valuable, something he could not bear to lose, had been left behind. That would explain both his visits, wouldn't it? 
Yes, you're right, I said, but you were going to tell me about the note that Garcia received at dinner on the evening of the murder. Ah, yes, that note shows that the woman who wrote it was involved in the plan, too. But where was she? I have already shown you that the place could only be some large house, and that the number of large houses is limited. Since we arrived in Esher, I have looked at all these houses and made inquiries about their owners. One house, and only one, especially attracted my attention. This was the famous old house called High Gable, one mile out of Oxshot. High Gable is less than half a mile from the place where Garcia's body was found. The other big houses belong to ordinary old-fashioned people, to whom nothing exciting ever happens. But Mr. Henderson, of High Gable, is certainly an unusual man, a man who would be likely to have strange adventures. I therefore decided to give all my attention to Mr. Henderson and the people in his house. They are a strange set of people, Watson. The man himself is the strangest of them all. I managed to think of a reason for asking to see him, but I think he guessed my real purpose. He is about fifty years old, strong and active, with grey hair and dark, deep-set, troubled eyes. He is a strong, hard, masterful man. Either he is a foreigner or else he has spent most of his life in very hot countries. His face is like leather. There is no doubt that his friend and secretary, Mr. Lucas, is a foreigner. He is chocolate brown, a cat-like person with a very gentle, polite voice. Gentle, but poisonous, and evil, I am sure. You see, Watson, we now know of two separate groups of foreigners, one at Wisteria House and the other at High Gable. I think we shall find the solution of our mystery in the connection between these two groups, Henderson and Lucas, who are close and trusted friends, are at the center of the High Gable group. But there is one other person who may be even more important to us in our present inquiries. Henderson has two young daughters, one is thirteen and the other is eleven. They are taught by a lady called Miss Burnett. She is an Englishwoman, about forty years old. I am particularly interested in Miss Burnett Watson. There is also one personal servant, a man. This little group forms the real family. They all travel about together. Henderson is a great traveler and is always on the move. It is only within the last few weeks that he has returned to High Gable after being away for a whole year. He is extremely rich, you see. He can easily afford to satisfy any desire as soon as he becomes conscious of it. The house is full of other servants of every kind. You know what the servants of a large English country house are like. They have very little work to do, but they eat meat four times a day. Servants can be very useful to a detective, you know. There is no better way of getting information than making friends with one of them. I was lucky enough to find a former gardener of Henderson's. His name is John Warner. Henderson dismissed him recently in a moment of temper. Luckily, Warner still has friends among the High Gable servants, who all greatly fear and dislike their master so I had a key to all the secrets of the place. And what a strange group of people it is, Watson. I don't understand everything yet, but it is certainly unusual. There are two wings to the house. The servants live on one side, and the family on the other. The only connection between the two is Henderson's own personal servant, who serves the family's meals. Everything is carried to a certain door in the servant's wing. This door is the only one that communicates with the other wing of the house. The girls and their teacher hardly ever go out, except into the garden, and Henderson never goes out alone. His dark secretary is like his shadow. The servants say that their master is terribly afraid of something. Warner says that he has sold his soul to the devil in exchange for money. The master's afraid that the ground will open and that the devil will come up to claim him, he says. Nobody knows where the Hendersons came from or who they are. They are very violent people. 
Twice Henderson has struck people with his whip and has had to pay them a lot of money in order to stay out of the courts.